Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Stunting. I am Diana, Femme Communications Manager, and it is my pleasure to be talking to Gavner all the way, all the way across the pond in the UK. If you can tell, the difference is literally night and day. Gavner, thank you for staying up. <laughs> no problem. Thank you for staying up and being with us. Um, so you are a digital abstract artist and you're also a femigenesis artist, we should say that, and an Adobe influencer. So yep. how, did you, uh, how did you get your start in art? I, when did you know that you weren't an artist? Oh, I've, oh, I've been an artist since I was a child, to be honest. I think, I think it was after I left school I got into the whole digital space. I started as a, a, a graphic designer and started using Photoshop Quark Express, Coral Draw back in year 2000. For the OGs who watch this don't know about like Coral Draw and Quark Express, but that's how I got into the game. And then from there, I started designing for maybe four or five years. And then I think it was about 2006, seven, I decided to get into the freelance space and branch away from, you know, like full-time employment and then yeah, from there, I just I just started freelancing for various companies and it grew from there. I think my first major client was uh, doing a logo for the Gladiators TV show. So in the UK, we have a, we had a show called The Gladiators. OK, it was a big, big show in in the UK, like 15, 20 years ago. And yeah, I did. I helped work on a logo for that. And it took off from there, to be fair. I've been freelancing ever since to this day. And here yeah. I am today. That's interesting. I mean, let's back it up a little bit. We have a number of people that watch this show. And when you said that you actually quit your nine to five, tell us, tell us a little bit more about that. Like, what was that like? Was it scary? Did you have a plan in place for anyone who's making that kind of consideration for that leap, you know? To be fair, I think it's always good if you take that leap when you're single and don't have any responsibilities. You know, as a family man now with three kids and a wife, it would have been tricky if I did that now. But back then, yeah, it was um, it was a risk I was willing to take. Because as I said, I was only young, 20 odd years old, and I just took the risk. I mean, I did work in freelance on the side for a portion of time. And then when I felt like I had enough, going on I decided to just take that leap it wasn't a smooth transition though. It, I, it didn't it wasn't plain sailing I didn't just you know I had I had quiet months and I had busy months I had to scrimp and save I had to borrow I had, you know it was up and down you know but I just kept going on then the client bill the client base just kept growing so so yeah so yeah that was 2006 I think 2007. Wow. So yeah. tell us who, who have you worked with internationally? Oh, so yeah, like I said, my first client was for it was for Sky TV for the gladiators. And then I and then I trying to think, I can't give you a timeline, but I can just give you names of clients. So I've been working with Adobe for about six, seven years now. They've mm -hmm. been my most regular client, to be fair. I worked for Sony Music in London. Worked for Microsoft. I worked for the NBA in New York. I uh, worked for McDonald's. I worked for Persil. Worked for NatWest. I worked for the F1 Lotus Ferrari team. I worked for uh, through Sony Music. I, I I I was privileged enough to work for various different clients like. Lenny, uh, Lenny Kravitz and Pharrell Williams do stuff for them for the presentations and stuff. So, Wow, very cool. Yeah, just very very, cool. various clients. And 90% of it was remote work as well. So I wasn't always working in the office. I was usually working remote, remotely. Mm -hmm. And they would find me online through various different platforms. Uh, and yeah, it's very, very random and sporadic. All I'd say is you have to get yourself out there as much as you can because... A classic example, uh, the NBA found me on Twitter back in 2000, and, I think it was like 2012. 
I put up an image of an NBA player that I illustrated just for fun, put it on my profile, and I tagged it. And then some, someone from the NBA just happened to find it through the tags, and they just contacted me and said, look, do you want to work with us for a year, illustrating in your style? And we'll put your work on social media and stuff. So I had a year contract with those guys. So very random. You know, but you have to get yourself out there as much as you can and be aggressive because there's a thousand people like me out there. Mm-hmm. You know, I never said I was the best at what I do, but they saw my work somehow, whether it was through Behance, Twitter, or other social networks or on Google. Just get yourself out there and just be aggressive with the marketing. So that that's the main thing I would say is, um, yeah, just be aggressive with the marketing really and and spend time studying how to keyword your profiles and how algorithms work and you know because most of these social sites have algorithms like google and, mm-hmm. they'll, and they'll scan your profile and look for the keywords so when someone types in i'm looking for an abstract artist in the uk you want your profile to come up first on the searches and that's more or less how i got involved Behance was a big place for me. Behance was a big, big like turning point using Behance because mm-hmm. yeah, Dolby team found me on Behance on the searches on the, I think it was like Photoshop lighting effects because my work is solely focused around light in effects and swooshes and swells. So that's how I keyworded my profile. And yeah, I just came up on the searches. They found me there. They asked me to do a talk for them at a big event in London. They went from there. So very nice. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's nice that it's that you have, you know, laid out a blueprint of sorts for for those artists who are coming up, who are new into the space, you know, just a little bit of marketing, a lot of hard work, and just like being a, on, on the, in the right place at the right time, because yeah. we like to say luck is when preparation meets opportunity, which is what happened with the NBA, right? Yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. I even used to use classified ad sites, uh, not Craigslist, but there's there's a site called Gumtree. You might have heard of Gumtree in the yeah, UK. Yeah, I have. Okay, so I worked out that Google loved Gumtree, for example, and Google favored Gumtree posts. So if you put an advert on Gumtree, Google will index it within ten minutes. So there is about three of us in England that worked out that if you put an advert on Gumtree, it will show up on a Google search. So I would keyword the my advert my services very carefully mm-hmm. and, I would, and I would put the town or the city that I wanted to appear in on the, the Gumtree ad knowing that within 10 minutes it would show up on the, the Google organic search so um, I used that and that's how Sony Music they found me through the Google search so and various other clients but people don't believe me when I tell them I said use Gumtree because Gumtree is not seen as a place to be putting your your services right right you know, when you want to sell stuff that's lying around the house you put it on gumtree but there was about three of us that worked out that if we just did that we would show up on the searches <laughs> yeah awesome that's awesome that's a great story um, yeah so yeah you you talked about your your collection so your collection on the Femi nft marketplace is how you envision energy the swishes and the swooshes and can you tell us about that that journey like how did you how did that come about like how 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 do you encapsulate what you really can't see as an artist uh to be honest I think I work subconsciously because throughout the years whenever I got work for major clients they would often hire me to to produce work of that style like back then I had probably like five different styles of art but that was the most prominent style that I got asked to produce work for Mm. and it's the style that I enjoyed the most as well so I didn't really realize where it was coming from probably up until last year when I reflected on like my core beliefs as a person like what I believe like you know because I'm I mean, I would say I'm a spiritual person. I'm a conscious person. I believe in God. And so I'm fascinated by like all things light, right? Anything that's to do with like energy, like unseen energies. Like I think about the emotions between 
to people that are in love if you could put on a pair of 3d goggles like what would it look like right because you know we say that animals can sense emotion they can sense fear but then if they can sense fear they can sense love right they can sense confidence you know so like what does it look like because it is actually there right so my work is exploring what the emotions would look like if you could see it like the flow the waves the flow between all living things and I just I just go with the flow when I work I just you know I don't have a particular right today I'm gonna encapsulate this emotion I just go with the emotion then I reflect on it afterwards right so that's I work backwards like that you know and uh, and so yeah the collections I've got out now we've got one collection called the color of love I've got another one called the color of consciousness and it just explores what it might look like if that's how we could see it you know so they say it's a never-ending journey of me exploring the unseen realms that we live in every day yeah i think that's that's really cool and when i came across your your art i was it was kind of like mind-blowing to see how you encapsulated what energy is i mean like i said this is what we feel and when you know you go when you look at it it's like oh well it could look like that and it really is as you say it definitely is an exploration and I feel that from your work and it's just like this rabbit hole that you just continue going down through because yeah it's never ending right exactly there's, there's yeah. never a right or wrong way to to encapsulate or exploit an emotion right the way how I might illustrate it today could be different in a year's time so I just keep going with it, right? Facts. Like, Facts. I like it. Yeah. So I like it because it it it's it's never ending. And I and I create all of my art in 3D space as well. So I use 3D software. So when I create the swishes and swells, I can rotate the cameras in various angles and just get different different ideas of how it might look. So it's easier in 3D, you see, when you've got the camera, because there's limitless possibilities to how it could look. So yeah. Yeah. So I might create a swoosh today and then tomorrow I could just I could just rotate the camera and it's a completely different swoosh because the angle's different. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's what, different vibe. It's a different vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I do. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, you have one of the as an artist, you have one of the most robust Discord groups I've seen. Can you talk to us about how building an, a community? around your nft project like how is the, how important is that for you do you know what to be honest as a freelancer when i first got into the the nft game back in march of last year i was thinking like a freelancer in other words we're in it for ourselves. we want to get a client get the job get paid and get out right so jumped into the nft space with the same mindset get in get buyers get paid stay in it get paid again stay and get paid and maybe get out right like, then i realized that this space is completely different to the freelance space because in the nft space everyone's about love and community and supporting each other in the freelance space that does not exist like there isn't there isn't even really any strong communities that i could say i've ever been part of mm. where we support each other we just it's dog eat dog to get the uh the, get the attention of the the big client right right so yeah yeah it's dog eat dog who's who's the most aggressive marketer who can be seen first who can email them before the other person emails them so you know there's no real togetherness in this game and especially when we've got similar styles of art in the nft space it's all about support i noticed everybody was very supportive and loving on the tweets and everybody was and i got back into twitter after like eight years of abandoning my profile it was dead it was dead like i had like three thousand followers from my freelance days and uh i realized too it was the place to be so i started to you know like other people's posts who were also in the space and i realized everybody was so kind and loving and it was actually a strange experience because i wasn't used to that wow so i decided that uh, after my first projects were released i realized that i didn't really have a community behind me but i saw a lot of other artists talk about having a community having a community 
if you put out art you need a team of people around you to support you and you need a community community all i kept seeing was community hashtag nft community so i thought about it uh, i put it off i thought about it again and i put it off because i just wasn't built to i spent like 15 years thinking about dog eat dog right yeah i'm thinking really is it that necessary to have a community really like shouldn't the art buyer just like the art like me and buy the art right and that's it (laughs) right so so i would like follow a lot of nft collectors and i would and i would read the tweets and i would try to understand where they're coming from a lot of them would say things like you know we like to buy art from people who are about community we want to buy from an artist who likes to support the community we want to know that there's a artist with longevity who likes to give back to the community so I kept hearing this word over and over again and it was eating away at me because I'm trying to work out like first of all how can I get a community you know uh-huh. and, then what, and then what do I do with it when I have it so mm-hmm. and then I also thought about the fact that most artists are introvert most artists are not they don't want to be in front of the camera most artists are not really they might have a social life there but in the creative world it's kind of them on a laptop or them on, a, on an iPad and I thought well if I could create an art community that was about networking with other people like myself that would stand out from the other discord projects because most projects are about it's simply about supporting the work of the artist solely so you put out a project and you want loads of people to support your project and everybody was doing that so I thought well if I had a community then there's more longevity and it's not just about me as an artist so I set up the Colour of Love Discord for that purpose to network with other artists and to help them in any way that I can to promote what they're doing so we've Mm -hmm. we've got some channels in there about marketing we do a Twitter space on a Sunday which is about different social strategies and how you can grow your profile for example okay whether it's how to use hashtags or how to build a profile from zero like how, a lot of artists have no idea what the basics they, they're creatives right they was never taught marketing you know a lot of us are self-taught marketing itself is like probably like 50 percent of the success right or probably yeah. even probably even more than that because yeah we see a lot of nft projects of art that doesn't necessarily look great but the marketing is great right so people buy into the hype as you uh-huh. know the pfp projects and whatnot so that's all hype it's clever marketing right so so i'd say maybe 70 percent of it is just good marketing mm-hmm. so i wanted to create a place that allowed other artists to communicate with each other on a creative level and also offer help if need be and to also help promote artists in the channels as well because we've got different channels you could post your art in and so i got a following on twitter and i reached out to one of my followers on twitter to follow the discord channel and i just took it from there that's 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 literally what i did i used my twitter profile yeah i think that's really really cool because I mean, you came from it. it. It took you a while to get to that decision. But once you landed on it, um, it's like you really found that sweet spot to create a, a number one, a safe space for yeah. us that is always welcoming, right? And at the same time, a space that creates service or fulfills a service, whereas that advice from, you know, those, of, those artists who have a little bit more experience you know, to the younger ones. Yeah. It's, 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 I, yeah, you really hit the nail on the head when it comes to community. And like I said, it's one of the most robust um, and supportive Discord groups that I have seen in my tenure in the NFT space. So kudos to you and the rest of the community for sure for that. Yeah. What has been your experience with the FIMI NFT marketplace so far? My experience with the FIMI marketplace has been enlightening because number one Miguel and Dixie reached out to me and that made me feel that made me feel special Mm -hmm. reached out to me on Twitter we had we had the zoom chat 
they've got other ideas on how we can work together outside of the marketplace. They offered for me to become a resident. Um, it just felt personal. I like how the female marketplace is reaching out to women, people of color, people like myself, people who are, how can I put it? People who are a small percentage in the creative space. And I appreciate that. I appreciate his openness and his willingness to help in, you know, in a very transparent way. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I thought that was great. And I love the fact that the marketplace allows artists to put up art on different blockchains as opposed to having to use ETH or having to just use Solana or having it open so that the buyer can choose. To be honest, that was the selling point for me. Besides mm -hmm. the personal touch. So if I didn't have that communication with Miguel and Dixie and I came across it, I would have used it simply for that reason. Different blockchains is golden. And I actually, I, I, I just, I, it, I'm shocked that, you know, others haven't caught on to this because I think that's golden. I just think it's golden because, you know, ETH is volatile, you know, but then Tezos might not be as volatile as ETH. So having it open for the buyer to choose is golden. Yeah, we have many buyers that want to keep their work, keep their, their collections on ETH, but then you have buyers on Solana, you have buyers on Stella. I haven't explored Stella yet, but there might be buyers who, want to, who specifically have their funds in Stella and want to buy my art. So I love the potential of the marketplace and where they want to take it going forward. So I actually told a lot of my Discord followers about it. And the, the, some of the guys started to put up work on there as well. So, so yeah, yeah. Very yeah. nice. Thank you so much for spreading the love. We really appreciate that for sure. All right, so Gavna, what's next for you? What do you have coming up? What do you have that you know we can um, check out? Because I see you have a sneaker collection. Yeah, got the trainer collection that I'm working on marketing. Do you have them over there? Not with me, no, not right now, no. Not right now to show you. Um, so I'm ordering in the samples. I've been putting up a collection of like 20 or 30 different designs. I've got a manufacturer in China. And so that's one aspect there. Then I'm growing my Discord channel. Mm -hmm. uh, another, I guess for me, it benefits me to grow the Discord and have it really active because people offer to advertise in there as well. People offer to, like they might say, put out an announcement for a project and they're willing to pay. So that's that's a positive for the Discord. Oh, for sure. Yeah, and then they're I've going got, where the, They're going where the eyes are. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, I've already had someone actually pay me to do that. But that works across all social profiles. So they might say, put out a tweet for me or retweet this put it yeah. in your discord and we'll pay you this much money so that's a positive of having a, an audience and then there's my my art prints as well i've got an art print site where i sell the prints print on demand so i've got a manufacturer that will just ship it out to the artists sorry the buyers wherever they are and then and then there's the freelance side which i'm slowly trying to navigate away from because ultimately my desire would be to be a full-time digital artist and to be able to wake up, create a swoosh, upload the swoosh, and have that swoosh on merchandise, have that swoosh on my footwear, for thousands of fans to appreciate and collect. That's what I'd love to do. So there's no pressure. I just create, and it sells. You see? Yeah. I've got yeah. audio, so. That's all like, that, that sounds doable. That's, and that's the life, right? That's, that's, the, that's the life. As, as, as my friends in Indonesia say, inshallah, God willing. And okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We definitely wish you best of luck. Thank you so much for joining us. We know it's probably way past your bedtime over there. Oh, no, no, no. I'll get started now. This is what, because I work at okay. nighttime, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for, um, thank you for being with us and taking the time. Um, it was really an enlightening conversation. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. See you next time on the next episode of Stuff.
stunting.